All right, gonna let you get on here before we start our Sunday evening devotion. Thank you for those of you that tuned in this morning. Uh, when you tune in tonight, let me know that you can hear me and go ahead and share this, like it, so other church members will see it. And we'll share God's word for a minute tonight and ask him to help us with it. If you got a prayer request you want us to uh, pray for, you can submit that or send it in to us. But we're going to take our Bibles to Mark chapter number 7 tonight. If you want to grab your Bible and go to Mark chapter number 7, we're going to share just a short devotion tonight and ask the Lord to help us. Lord willing, the plan will be to be back together Wednesday, but you just watch your phone tree and check here on Facebook for that. So Mark chapter 7, if you have your Bible and you want to turn there, if not, that's okay too. Um, we referenced this passage of Scripture last Sunday in Sunday evening's message. One part of one verse from this we mentioned, and I want to take just kind of the whole thought here and dissect it together. I, I felt like the Lord put it on my heart and like it's a good follow-up for Sunday night's message. We talked about guarding our minds, and I, I'm sure all of us would agree, as we did Sunday night, that we need to guard our minds, but I believe there's another aspect entwined in that that's that we need to guard our hearts. Um, the illustration we used Wednesday night is that the heart is where the seed is planted and the mind waters it, but I believe that you and I can take action when the seed is planted, even if it's a wrong seed, that you and I can guard our hearts. We need to do that. So we're going to read in Mark chapter 7, and we're going to read just parts of these verses, but before we do, want to pray and ask the Lord to help us. We, we can't share his word without his help. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this time to get on Facebook and Lord, to share another devotion, Lord, we, we want so badly to be together in person, but we thank you that we have this technology, Lord, not only to um, allow our church members to watch, but Lord, many others today that I've heard from that have tuned in, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you just speak to us through your word and help us to be people that guard our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark chapter 7, what we're reading here is... Uh, Jesus responding to the Pharisees. This is what it says in verse 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders." Remember that part right there, the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And he answered and said unto them, Well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other things as ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. I mean, can you imagine being the Pharisees in this portion of Scripture, especially? Jesus just calls them out and immediately calls them hypocrites. And what's the context of going on that's going on in this passage of Scripture that we need to understand is part of the Jewish tradition that's being held in this time. In this portion of Scripture, uh, the Pharisees witnessed the disciples, much like when the Pharisees witnessed the disciples picking grain on the Sabbath day, they, they threw a fit then too. And they do the same thing here because they witnessed the disciples begin to eat without washing their hands. Now, let's establish contextually first that 
to the Jews, this wasn't about a hygiene thing. Jesus is not telling you and I to not wash our hands before we eat. He's not talking about hygiene. To the Jews, the washing of their hands, we study, links all the way back to the law of Moses. In that the priest had to uh, properly cleanse their self before they could go into the temple and before they could minister their, administer their service to the Lord. Before the, the high priest would go into the holiest of all, he would have to go through some cleansing rituals. That was the law of Moses, the law which was given by God. But what you and I looked at last Sunday, we, we made mention and made reference to, is that the Pharisees, they took the law of God, they put their own twist on it, and they made it into a tradition. So they believed here, there's, there's several different ideas of what the Pharisees Ref are referencing here. Some of some scholars believe that the, they would pour water over their hands and they would wash their hands up to the wrist. Some believe this to mean that they would wash the food when they got back from the marketplace because their fear was that when they went to the marketplace or went out for the daily duties that they had touched something and that they had become unclean. Now, again, we're not talking about hygiene things. We're talking about the Jews elevating themselves and thinking that if they touch anything of the Gentiles, it has made them unclean. So they are not throwing a fit here because the disciples didn't get the dawn dish soap and wash their hands before they ate dinner. They're throwing a fit here because they are saying that the disciples did not keep the tradition. It said in verse 3, Jesus, the Bible said, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not. Why? Because they are holding the tradition of the elders. Now, before we get into the part about guarding your heart, I, I just feel the need to make this statement. And I, I hope that you don't take this out of the context of what I'm saying, but Jesus was condoning the tradition that they were carrying down right here. Tradition is a good thing in some aspects. Tradition has been handed down through the years, and that is what has formed our churches. If you're a part of Black Oak or if you're from another church, it's formed the style of music that you sing. It has formed the clothes and the dress that we wear to church. It's formed how we facilitate services. But I want us to be careful in church life and in our own life concerning traditions. Because this tradition was not a good tradition. This tradition was a tradition that was forcing the people into legalism instead of into a relationship with Jesus. And, and I think I made reference to this last week that to me, now, I feel like sometimes I'm an old soul trapped in a young body. I, I, I love old music. I love old-fashioned preaching. But with that, I love the new music too. As long as it is theologically sound, I'm good with it. But when we get into a place of where we say we can only sing red back hymns to honor God, we're getting into a place of where we are grabbing tradition. When we say we have to wear a three-piece suit to walk into the house of God, we are grabbing tradition because Jesus did not wear a suit. And I know that that is not a theological good argument for today, but I'm simply making the reference to that we don't need to be stuck in tradition. We need to be focusing on our heart. We need to be focusing on our walk with God more than on our tradition. Now, we do need to sing songs that are theologically sound and that are, are based out of the word of God. We do need to dress our best when we come to the house of God. And the way my mama raised me is we're going to dress our best to go somewhere else or to go on a date. We ought to do that for the Lord. But we need to position ourselves in a place of where we are pursuing our relationship with Jesus and not tradition. The Jews and the Pharisees were where they were right here because they thought we have to cleanse ourselves specifically so that we don't defile ourselves when we sit down at the dinner table. And Jesus calls them out on that. He says in verse 6 that they are honoring me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He said full well in verse 9, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. He called the Pharisees out and said, you're not obeying what my word says. He said, you're obeying what you think my word needs to say. 
And may I say that you and I don't have the place, the authority, or the ability to add anything or take anything away from this book. The book of Revelation actually warns against that, that if we seek to do that, our name is removed from the book of life. And Jesus will go on, we won't read them, but in the next few verses, he's going to call the Pharisees out. And he's going to use the example that you have broken the fifth commandment, that you are not honoring your mother and your father. He said to them um, that they were giving their tithes. If you're reading a King James Version, your Bible in verse 11 is going to use the word Corbin. And what that is, you look back at the book of Numbers, that was a specific offering that was given to God. And the Pharisees were giving their offering to God, which made it a special offering that could only be used for those services, but they were still benefiting off of the interest of that money and leaving their parents destitute. Jesus used this as an example to point out to them that you are only keeping tradition and you are not truly fulfilling my law. And then Jesus gets back to the part about his disciples not washing their hands ceremonially before they sit down to eat. If you have your Bible open, look, look at verse 14. Jesus said, and when he had called all the people unto them, he said unto them, hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering him can defile him, but the things which come out of him are those that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning this parable. And he said unto them, are ye so without understanding also? Do not you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him. Because it entereth not into his heart, but into his belly, and goeth out into the drought, purging all meats. And he said, this which cometh out of the man defileth the man. So now Jesus is talking about physical food. The disciples were sitting down to eat physical food. The Pharisee said, if you're not going to keep the, the ritual of cleansing your hands and cleansing your food before you sit down, you're going to be unclean. And Jesus tells them, no matter if they touch the food with defiled hands, well, let's use the word, if they touch the food with dirty hands and they eat the food, it will not defile them. Now, when I end this devotion, I'm going to walk back to my house I'm going to wash my hands, and Lord willing, I'm going to eat dinner. And if I did not wash my hands, we would say from a hygienic standpoint that that's, that's bad, that's disgusting. You need to wash your hands to be clean. But the word defileth in the Greek here, it, it means to literally make unclean in a spiritual sense, not a physical sense. Jesus said if they touch this food without washing their hands and they eat it, they're not defiled. He said, because it's going into their belly, not into their heart. What you and I chew and swallow does not go to our heart. It goes to our belly. And then by the natural process of our bodies, that food is later disregarded. It, it enters the man. It leaves the man. Here's what I want to talk to you about for just a few minutes, if you'd stay on here. Jesus is saying what comes out of a man is what defiles him. He, he went on in verse 21 and he said, this is the verse we, we looked at just briefly in Sunday night sermon. He said, from within, out of the heart of men. So this is coming out of man's heart. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful and above all else wicked. From within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, proceed adulteries, fornications, murders, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defileth the man. So the Pharisees setting their law up, Jesus cancels what they are saying right here. And matter of fact, I forgot to tell you what Jesus said about the Pharisees in Matthew 23 verse 4. He said, by what they're doing, they're simply binding heavy burdens and grievous to be born, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So Jesus said the laws that the, the Pharisees or the traditions they're trying to pass down is placing burdens on other men's shoulders, but they won't even lift a finger for that in their own life. So they were willing to try to keep other people to keep the law that they wouldn't keep themselves. So Jesus is saying that I believe here that there is a need to guard our hearts. 
I believe there is a need from a physical standpoint to wash our hands before we eat. I believe from a physical standpoint, we need to watch what we put in our body physically. We need to watch what we eat. We need to honor our body as the temple of the Lord. That, that's what the Bible tells us. We need to guard those things. But in this context of Scripture, Jesus is saying we don't need to guard what comes in. We need to guard what comes out. If the heart is deceitful and above all else wicked, and we said this Sunday night that in the heart the seed is planted. When we think on it, we water the seed, and then it comes to fruition. But let's just be practical right now. All of us on here, maybe you've been out. We had to get out and go to the grocery store earlier, and I was reminded of why we canceled service because I slid sideways up Black Oak Road trying to come home. And maybe you were out driving and somebody was driving like they don't need to have a driver's license. Maybe you got cut off in traffic. Maybe somebody sent you a mean message. Maybe, maybe something's happened today and it's made you angry. And that anger produces a response. Where is that happening? It's not happening here. It's not happening in the soul. It's not happening just in the flesh. It is happening in the heart. When evil thoughts come to your mind, those are happening in the thought, in your heart. When covetousness, when jealousy comes to mind and you want what somebody else has, it's coming from your heart. Wickedness is coming from your heart, Jesus said. Deceit, lasciviousness, we discussed that word last Sunday night, which means an unbridled or uncontrolled lust. That is formed in your heart. Blasphemy, pride, foolishness is formed in your heart. And Jesus is telling the disciples now, he's not talking to the Pharisees now, they have went inside and the disciples are trying to understand what Jesus is saying. And he is setting them up for contextually to live for him through their ministry. And he tells them, boys, don't worry so much about being ceremonially clean when you eat. He said, be concerned and worried about what you say. May I say that many of people, and I have been there at times, have tarnished their testimony by things that came out of their mouth in a split second. The writer of Proverbs said that there's power of life and death in the tongue. I have heard many of people that claim to love Jesus with their lips, but what came out of their heart, it didn't match up. Times in my life, when I have allowed my flesh to fuel me, when I have allowed what we preach Sunday morning, when I've fulfilled the flesh instead of walking in the Spirit, in those moments, I have been a person earlier on in my Christian walk that said, I love Jesus with my mouth, but my heart didn't. We made this analogy Sunday night that if we were able to examine our mind, what would our mind say that I love Jesus? We looked at the verse that, in the gospel where Jesus told us to love the Lord our God, the first and greatest commandment with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with everything in us. When you look back in Deuteronomy chapter number 6, when Moses is giving the law in chapter 6, and throughout various chapters, Moses gives the commandment that the Lord gives. What's the first thing? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart. I wonder tonight, if we were to examine our hearts, what is festering inside of there? Would our hearts say, I love Jesus? When we are mad at our neighbor, when we want revenge, when we are upset with a fellow church member, when we are upset with our family, when we're jealous about what somebody else has that we don't have, when we are letting all of these things come out, our hearts are not saying that I love Jesus and from there, our minds are not saying, I love Jesus, because our heart is producing evil thoughts. I thought about what the writer of Proverbs said in chapter 4, in verse 22 and 23. He said, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. He's talking about obeying and staying on the path of wisdom. And he said in verse 23, and, and I, I want you to keep this in mind as, as we begin to close the devotion tonight. In verse 23, he said, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. If you're reading a different translation or the translation that we see and hear articulated the most and posted the most is to guard your heart above all else because everything flows from it. I want to encourage you on a Sunday night, church family, what we looked at last week, don't just guard your mind. 
Guard your heart. Person who's watching this that maybe is not a member of our church, maybe you're a visitor, maybe you're somebody totally different. I'm so honored that you're watching, but I want to encourage you tonight as a believer to guard your heart. But I also want to warn you in this sense of where the Lord has been warning me, and, and then I'll be done. I thought about Jesus telling them, you know, don't worry about what you're putting in. And, and of course, contextually, you know me, context, context, context. We need to understand that, to understand what the text is saying. We need to pull from it, not add to it. Jesus is saying, don't be concerned about being ceremonially clean to eat. But as I thought about this today and thought about this through the day, we do need to be careful about what we're putting in. Because what we are putting in, I'm not talking about what you're eating for dinner. What we are putting in is going to fuel what's coming out. There is a plethora of movies that we can watch today. And some of them seem innocent, but in reality, they're not. I, I would hold my smartphone at this point, but I, I can't because I'm going live on it. There is a plethora of things that we can get on on our phone that may seem innocent, but they're not. The, the challenge that we've been given a lot in our, our men's Sunday school class that we've started is to be more engaged in the word and work of God than we are on Facebook. Can I be honest, sitting in my office as the pastor of Black Oak Baptist Church, that a lot of times it is so easy, and I have talked to so many of you, and you'd say the same thing. And I'm going to be honest, I, I had to figure out how to download the page app so I could still do this tonight and remove Facebook app from my phone again because it's so easy to sit down and it seems so innocent to scroll. And don't don't quote me wrong, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Facebook, but there is something wrong when Facebook has you. There, there's nothing wrong with scrolling through social media, but before we know it, our minds are engaged in that and an hour's past. And it's so easy for something to pop up that we that shouldn't pop up for a post, for a joke, or whatever you have. It's so easy to turn on the TV and to flip through channels and something to come on that we should not be letting come in. It's so easy to be surrounded by others that maybe are not believers, and we need to be around them to let our light shine to them, be a witness. But it might be so easy for some of us to allow those things to come inside of us, and then they affect what comes out of us. Here's what I want to tell us tonight. That we need to guard our hearts because we're living in a wicked world. And we're living in a wicked world because everybody in this world, Jeremiah said, has a deceitful heart. And you and I are in a battle against the Adamic spirit. That's the old nature if you're a believer. We're in a battle against the flesh. We are in a battle against all of the forces of evil to live lives that glorify God. I want. I thought about the, the woman at the well that Jesus said, if you drink of the water that I have to give you, if you drink of this fountain, he said, it's going to spring up inside of you and it's going to come out as everlasting life. But he said, if you drink of this physical fountain from which she was trying to draw, he said, you're going to thirst again. We need to be careful on this Sunday night of which fountain we're drinking from. Lord, help me and Lord, help us to drink from this fountain. When you get upset at home, when you get upset at the kids, when you get upset at the animals, when you get upset at the, at the person down the street, when you get upset at your coworker, guard your heart. Preacher, how do I do that tonight? And, and I'm, I'm done with the devotion and we'll pray. How do I guard my heart? We, logistically, we looked last Sunday night how do we guard our minds? We went through so many verses about how to guard our minds. And then we, we prayed something together as we closed the lesson. We prayed from Psalm 139 where our devotion came from Wednesday night. And we prayed what David prayed. Search me, O Lord, and know me. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there be a wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. But David prayed in another place after Nathan confronted him for his sin of Bathsheba, because what did Jesus say? Out of the heart comes adultery, and David did not guard his heart. Committed adultery with Bathsheba, we know that story. Psalm 51, we believe, is the repentive prayer of David after he comes to the realization of his sin. And this is what he prayed. You can go read the whole chapter later, but this is what he prayed in verse 10. 
He prayed, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Whether you have been putting the wrong stuff in and the wrong stuff's coming out, and that's defiling you. It's defiling your testimony. It's making you, it doesn't only make you appear unclean, it makes you feel unclean. It makes you feel miserable. Maybe tonight you would understand that you can pray what David prayed. I feel like I pray this every day. And you can allow the Lord to create a clean heart in you so that the right thing will come out. I don't know about you on a Sunday night, but I want the right thing to come out and I want to put the right thing in. I want to spend time in God's word more than I spend time in what the news of this world has to tell me. I want to spend time talking to God as I begin my day and through my day because that is the only correct thing to put in to make the right thing come out. When others look at me, I want them to see a well of living water that's springing up to everlasting life. I don't want them to see something that's dead, polluted, and dying. But the only way to do that tonight is to guard what's coming out and to guard what's coming in. Would you take this challenge with me? Would you, especially church members, visitors, but everybody watching, would you pray David's prayer? Lord, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. Would you commit to praying that every morning? And would you commit to watch what you put in and to guard what's coming out that we can live for the glory and the honor of God? Let's pray together tonight. Father, thank you so much for, again, the ability to do this. Thank you for Facebook and, and the aspects that we can share, uh, Lord, church services with our members, with visitors, with those that want to watch. And Lord, I pray, God, that for myself first, that you would guard my heart. Lord, I pray that for every person watching or who will watch. And I pray that you would create in us clean hearts and renew in us right spirits and right minds, Lord, that we would not only guard what's coming out, but we would guard what's going in in a spiritual aspect, that we could live for the glory of God. Lord, I want my life to count for your glory. Lord, I want every person watching that their life would count for your glory. So, Lord, I pray that you would create us in us clean hearts and help us to guard our hearts because above it, above all else, everything is flowing from that source. Lord, may it pour out love and the fruits of the Spirit, not the works of the flesh. We love you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching tonight. Uh, just keep your eye on Facebook. Um, keep your eye on the phone tree. Uh, hopefully, God willing, we'll be back to normal Wednesday. The sun's supposed to come out and warm up the next few days, so hopefully it'll melt this ice. If we are going to cancel, we'll make a, a post about it. If we don't make a post about it, come on out. That means we're having church at 6 o'clock. Praying for all of you to have a good week. Stay safe going back to work tomorrow. And thank you for joining in with us. I love you all. Have a good night.